those of us who grew up playing on computers like the ZX Spectrum and C64 always wanted to get a little bit of the arcade experience into our home, even if we knew that our machines weren't exactly able to bring the games over flawlessly. The graphics and the sound and whatever may take a bit of a hit, but if the gameplay's still there, then we're happy. Naturally, lots of arcade ports are available for these systems, ranging from the excellent to the execrable, and some software houses really tried to bring as many arcades as possible over to the micro faithful, Ocean Software being chief amongst them. And today we're looking at something by them that wasn't just a great port on its own, but a game that ended up taking a whole new life outside of its arcade origins on the micros. One of their greatest successors, Renegade. Renegade on its own is the sort of arcade experience that micro users were crying out for, the ability to play a decent game where you could happily bash the faces of some bad guys in and make them suck sidewalk, the sort of thing that you certainly got plenty of in the arcades after the original's release, but was perhaps at first seen as a bit tougher to do on the micros. By the time the game came to the Speccy in 1987, people wanted more than arcade ports that were beholden to Golden Age titles. They wanted something a bit fancier and a bit more violent. Renegade would give it to them, and it would prove so successful that Ocean ended up producing their own sequels to the game. Sequels that would actually be pretty worthy titles too. Well, one of them would be anyway. The other one was a disaster, but we'll get to that. So here's a look at how Technos' legendary arcade game ended up taking on a life of its own on the 8-bit micros. A journey through Renegade, Target to Renegade, and yes, Renegade 3 the final chapter. We should have a little look at Technos Japan's original arcade first, just for a bit of context. The original Renegade was released to the arcades in 1986, coming out first in Japan under the title Niketsu Kuha Kunio Kun. The Japanese original features hot-blooded tough guys beating the crap out of each other. You play as Kunio, a bad boy high school teenager who's getting into all kinds of fights with gans who bully his weaker schoolmate, Hiroshi. Yoshihisa Kishimoto, the game's creator, drawn his own real-life experiences to make the game. He himself was a furio, or bad boy, and he spent most of his high school years getting into scraps with other bad boys. A great deal of this past went into Kunio-kun, alongside inspiration from films such as Enter the Dragon and previously successful beat-em-ups like Iwem's Kung Fu Master, and the original Kunio-kun proved to be a big hit when it was released by Taito in 1986. Not only that, it was influential. Kunio-kun was the first beat-em-up that allowed you to move both horizontally and vertically over the plane, a playfield that's technically known as the Belt Scroll and was more commonly found in early racing games and the like. The Belt Scroll proved to be a pretty great fit for beat-em-ups, and Kunio can popularise the style that would be seen in, well, so many other games in the genre going forward. While Kunio Kun's first adventure would be the start of a whole series of games in Japan in which Kishimoto's semi autobiographical creation did things like play dodgeball, football, and hockey alongside beating up more of his classmates, when it came to localising the game for Western audiences, it was thought that the high school setting wouldn't be a good fit. It wasn't necessarily due to worries about the setting being thought of as too controversial or violent in the West. Technos had already had to field plenty of complaints from concerned parents in Japan about that, and according to Kishimoto in Retro Gamer, the game apparently already had the dubious credit of bringing Furios back into the game sensors after they'd been driven away by cuter games like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and Mappy, so any complaints about violence wouldn't be anything new. Rather, the company's American arm didn't think that the Japanese high school setting would be all that appealing to Western audiences, and that they wouldn't get any of the game's references. Kishimoto was pointed in the direction of the classic 1979 film The Warriors, and that became the main inspiration for the game's localization. Exit Kunio-kun and enter Renegade, a game where your black-vested and camo-jeaned hero beats the crap out of Gans in the big city and rescues his girlfriend at the end. The game proves to be a big hit in the West, just as it was in Japan, and both of these original versions also end up getting ported to the Famicom and the NES, Technos Japan's first foray into the home. As far as Technos Japan goes, localising Renegade for a Western audience and porting it over to the NES is the end of their involvement here. 
Kunio kun moves off into another direction, while Kishimoto also moves on, revolutionising the arcade beat em up even further with his next title, the seminal Double Dragon. As a matter of fact, Yoshihisa Kishimoto was never even aware of Renegade's second life until he was interviewed about the game for a 2012 article in Retro Gamer. He was too busy to notice. The rest of this story takes place in the dungeon on Central Street in Manchester, where Ocean Software secures the rights to port Technos' game over to the ZX Spectrum and other computers following its arcade success. Ocean already had plenty of experience with arcade ports. They first made their name with unofficial takes on the likes of Missile Command, Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, as well as licensed titles that took plenty of inspiration from arcades, such as the huge hit Daily Thompson's Decathlon, essentially an unofficial track and field. Their reputation as an arcade port and licensed game studio was very much established by 1987, although the quality of their games could be pretty variable. The best Ocean games were fantastic, such as their ports of Hypersports and Mikey, both done by the legendary Jonathan Joffa Smith. Other licensed affairs shipped out to external studios like Canvas. Well, that includes games like Highlander, It's a Knockout and Street Hawk that were abject disasters and legitimately amongst the very worst games ever put out for the 8-bit micros. The company were largely successful, but there was a drive to increase the general quality of their output, to really push the new 1-8K spectrum, to do more development internally in the dungeon under Friends Meeting House, and to not repeat the sort of disasters that the likes of Canvas were responsible for, a push headed up by Gary Bracey, Vice President of Development. The Imagine Software label, acquired by Ocean after the spectacular demise of the original Liverpool company in 1984, would be the home for a lot of these higher quality products, eventually including Renegade. The job of porting the game would be handed over to a man who'd go on to be another star amongst the company's coders, Michael Lamb. Lamb had originally scored on the Speccy with the popular Steve Davis snooker, released by CDS in 1984, and he'd find himself at Ocean a couple of years later. There was no special reason why he was given Renegade as such, he'd just finished working on a pretty decent port of Taito's Arkanoid to the Speccy, and therefore he was free to work on the Spectrum version of Renegade, which would be the lead platform that other versions for the C64 and Amstrad CPC, amongst other computers, was based on. He didn't actually play the arcade game until Ocean Software got themselves aboard for the dungeon, a game that proved to be pretty popular with the staff to the point where Lamb had to take control of the office arcade and place it under lock and key so that he could actually use the machine to work on his port. Ronnie Fowles worked on the graphics with Mike Lamb, just as he'd done on Arkanoid, while the excellent Fred Gray provided the game's music. As was often the case, the legendary Bob Wakelin provided the game's box art, although another special mention has to be given to Oliver Frey. His Crash Magazine cover art featuring Renegade is one of his many iconic creations, and probably also helped to sell the game. Originally previewed by magazines in June of 1987, Renegade was delayed a little bit, but eventually released to the micros in around about August or so and quickly gained some high praise from the mags of the time, very solid scores in the high 80s and 9 out of 10 range. And it immediately proved to be a very popular game indeed, just the sort of arcade style beat em up action that people were looking for. It helped that there weren't exactly a lot of other beat em ups on the ZX Spectrum. Before Renegade, by far the best effort in the genre was probably Gremlin and Sean Hollingworth's The Way of the Tiger, a ninja themed side scroller from 1986 and a pretty big game at the time that's not actually that bad at all. There's a few one on one fighters that are pretty decent, but not many other beat em ups aside from miserable ports of the likes of Shaolin's Road and Kung Fu Master. Ocean's Renegade is so far removed from any of these titles, and just one look at the game is enough to see the reasons why. Again, even if you can't get anything like an arcade perfect conversion on the spectrum, it's all about getting the feel of the arcade just right, and this Renegade absolutely nails that, while also having some pretty decent and colourful graphics for the machine. It's a stellar conversion, one of the absolute best in the entire spectrum library. Why does it work so well? Well first off you've got the requisite amount of bad guys for this to feel like a proper fight. 
just like the arcade, you're surrounded by enemies, you're going to have to move carefully and control the crowds in order to avoid getting battered, and you've only got a couple of minutes to beat all these guys up as well as the boss. It also manages to do this at a pretty good speed too. This game only ever slows down a little bit, even with all the sprites it's putting on the screen, and the ability to put this number of sprites on the screen is something that the Specky version majorly has over the C64, which can't quite do the same thanks to some of the quirks of its VIC-2 chip and its slower processor. Then there's the controls, which are pretty well done and intuitive. The original Renegade is a free button arcade game, which could be a challenge for systems where almost every joystick is one button, and therefore most games have to stick to a single button for firing. But Renegade uses directions and a button press to map the different actions in a way that still feels quite fluid, and means that our hero doesn't lose any of his moves, at least not on the 128k specy version that's here. He can punch and kick, but he can also grab enemies, knee them, throw them, and pummel them on the ground. That said, the enemies can do a lot of these fins too, while also having fins like motorbikes, charging attacks, and weapons at their disposal. Again, technical limitations aside, very little is actually missing here from the arcade experience. And that includes the levels too. They're all here, present and correct. You get the first level on the subway, and the second on the docks, where you do also have a rather convenient edge at your disposal where you can happily send goons flying off into the abyss. Then there's the third level in the Red Light District, including the battle with the almighty Big Bertha, and the fourth level outside the boss's lair where the goons carry knives that can kill you in one hit. Lastly, there's the battle with Mr. Big and his own goons where the boss can kill you instantly by shooting you in the face, you beat him up, and then you've won. Naturally, the game loops over and over, with the difficulty getting harder each time. It's certainly a game you can learn. It rewards you for beating enemies as fast and cleanly as possible, and massive high scores are certainly very achievable if you can keep going through loops. Again, just like the arcade. And if you're playing the 128K version, you've got cool music and sound effects to keep you going too. It all adds up to one of the machine's very best arcade conversions, and one of the Spectrum's crowning titles. Again, while the other 8-bit computer versions aren't that bad either, the Specky is definitely where this game shines the brightest, and it's one of the very top games on the entire system. It was thought of that way back then, and it very much still is now. Still, it's not necessarily the most common thing to have a completely original sequel to an arcade port even if it's one that was as successful as Renegade was. But in this case, it happened. So, how do we get from here to Target Renegade, released for the Micros in 1988? Wouldn't it be more of an obvious move for Ocean Software to do a port of Technos' next big arcade smash, Double Dragon, instead? Well, yeah, of course it would, and they tried to do exactly that. However, they were beaten to Double Dragon's rights by Melbourne House, who then proceeded to release several absolutely dreadful ports of the game to various platforms in 1989. I mean, seriously, the micro versions of DD all uniformly stink to high heaven. So count yourself lucky if you've ever complained about the NES or Master System ports. Weirdly, Ocean did actually release their own version of Double Dragon for the C64 in 1992, although it's incredibly obscure. Thrown out there in cartridge form only, and even then only sold on mail order lists and at trade shows, it's also pretty bloody lousy. I guess it's the closest thing there is to an exclusive C64 game system title? <laughs> Anyway, despite not having the rights to Double Dragon, they essentially decided to make their own unofficial Double Dragon, and that game would end up being Target Renegade. Cunningly, they had the ability to do such a thing legally. When they signed up the license for the first Renegade from Technos Japan, they also acquired the rights to create an unspecified sequel to the game. With no actual sequel from Technos coming, Ocean Software were able to make their own. Mike Lamb once again handled the coding for this title, this time with Dawn Drake working on the art, and the duo of Jonathan Dunn and Gary Bissalio handling the game's slow and somewhat melancholy soundtrack. 
The premise here is a bit different. Rather than doing the usual thing and rescuing your girlfriend, you're now taking revenge for your murdered brother, who got a bit too close to the antics of Mr Big and paid the price for it. And so you've got to fight through all of the many goons out there once again just to get to Mr Big and give him another jolly good pasted. Rather than being set in an arena of sorts, this is now a game with traditional levels that go from A to B, and the gameplay is largely the same as the original, only now there's the addition of weapons that you can pick up. Also, crucially, the game can now be enjoyed by two players at the same time, not always a common thing on the 8-bit micros. So yeah, in many ways it's a lot like Double Dragon. You get five levels to go through, a multi-story car park, a CD street, a park, a shopping mall, and finally Mr Big's bar. At the end of each level, a phone rings and you pick it up, presumably telling you where to go next. This little Dirty Harry inspired touch was apparently a suggestion from John Woods, one of Ocean's head honchos, and as we'll see it's not his only contribution to the game. So this game here, it's absolutely fantastic. The best side scrolling beat em up on the spectrum, and quite frankly there's nothing else that comes remotely close. While it's not quite as manic as the original Renegade, the amount of action fits the much larger levels nicely. There's still an awful lot of fighting to do before you reach this game's end. The addition of weapons is a pretty good one, especially as they become very handy in the game's later levels. You really need them to beat the last level's vicious bald fucks up, that's for sure. And of course our hero can still do everything he could do in the first game. Grab enemies by the labels and knee them in the ghoulies, pummel them on the ground, chuck them all over the shop, it's suitably down and dirty beat em up action, and the setting also matches it. Once again, the art here on the spec is wonderfully drawn. The soundtrack is a, an odd one. A slow, minor, and rather downcast choice for a beat em up game is one of those things where your mileage may vary. Personally, I love this game's soundtrack, probably because it's so different from any other beat em up I can think of. The C64 version of the game does an even better and more well-rounded job with the soundtrack, seeing as it's very suitable for the SID chip, although again the Commodore does suffer a bit in the gameplay department when compared to the Spectrum version. There's just something about this game really that makes it so much more suited to the ZX Spectrum than any other platform, even beyond it just being the lead platform. Target to Renegade is certainly a much beloved triumph for the 8-bit micros, and it's certainly far better than Melbourne House's official port of Double Dragon, by a very long distance. If you want to see the definitive specky beat em up, the one that you could say was the system's Streets of Rage or whatever, yep, yeah, this is it. Later efforts couldn't hope to top it, whether they were games that were clearly highly inspired by Renegade, such as Player's Subway Vigilante, or later arcade ports such as Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles and the um, rather inadvisable Final Fight. There's also a little bit of an amusing surprise at the end when you actually face Mr Big, at least if you know your Ocean Software history. As you beat the toss out of him with a snooker cue, you may realise that he bears a striking resemblance to John Woods. Again, Ocean's co-founder, along with David Ward. Yes, this was intentional, and happily John Woods didn't mind too much. I guess this is another one of the few games where you get to kill a games company's boss at the end, meaning that if you've ever wanted to put Target to Renegade and Doom 2 together, now you can. Also in another move that muddies the timeline a little, Target to Renegade itself ended up getting a NES port courtesy of Software Creations, where it could duke it out alongside the likes of River City Ransom, or other street gangs if you're in Europe. The NES Target Renegade is, alas, only a so-so title, although it does have the bonus of an excellent and more traditional beat-em-up soundtrack, courtesy of the great Tim Follin. So, Ocean Software made a sequel to a game that wasn't originally theirs, and it actually turned out to be fantastic. Well done guys! 
I only wish I could say now that they then decided to quit while they were still ahead and move on to other projects. But alas, no. They just had to go and make another Renegade game in 1989, didn't they? And in doing so, they had to not just completely wreck everything that made the first two games so good, but create something that's absolutely baffling in every possible way. Yes, it's time to have a proper look at Renegade 3 The Final Chapter. I certainly wish we weren't doing such a thing, seeing as I don't particularly care to admit that this game even exists, but that's the way it's gotta be. Anywho, the first issue for the third Renegade game is that the series no longer has the star programmer who helped make the first two games so good. Not that Mike Lamb wasn't doing pretty well for himself. After Target Renegade, his next project was Robocop, the company's biggest ever hit, one of the biggest games of the 1980s in the UK, just a massive, massive smash all around, and another all-time great specky game. His next game after that one? Batman the Movie, another sales juggernaut, and excellent title. Needless to say, this was more than enough for Mike Lamb to be getting on with. While he's busy becoming a specky superstar, he's got no time for Renegade 3. Instead, the venerable Andrew Deakin takes over the helm. Responsible for ports such as Athena, Combat School, and Operation Wolf, he pairs up with his usual graphics partner, Ivan Horn, with the aim of getting Renegade 3 out there in a typically tight deadline of a couple of months or so. Still, all this chopping and changing kind of powers in comparison to the management's ideas for the sequel. Yes, apparently it's someone in the top brass who had the bright idea of deciding that in the third game, our hero should have his girlfriend kidnapped by an evil force from the future, meaning that he now has to travel through time in order to save her. Gary Bracey has been asked whether it was his idea, and according to him, well, he can't remember. Perhaps it was? Who knows? If it is his fault, he does at least have enough good stuff under his belt at Ocean for his reputation not to be completely sullied by it. With this whole time-travelling plot going on, Renegade 3 naturally is meant to have a bit of a different feel to the previous two much grimier and altogether more serious games. It is supposed to be a more light-hearted affair, and perhaps this more comedic spin on the beat-em-up genre is one of the reasons why some reviewers actually welcomed the game. For all that I'm going to say about this title, Renegade 3 actually still reviewed pretty well at the time, even earning a 91% score from Crash Magazine. Are you sure about that? But then, playing the game? Well, when you do that, you wonder how the hell that happened at all, because this game is wretched. A complete disappointment for fans of the series, not necessarily because of the silly premise, but because the game itself was dreadful. Our shades wearing hero has managed to lose basically all of his moves. He had so many before, and now he can literally do nothing but a basic punch and a kick. He can do a flying kick and a crouching punch as well, but that's it. Punching, kicking, and now tilts. The knees, throws, and pummels have all gone. He doesn't even have a different animation for jumping, for heaven's sake. He just walks in the air. This is, um... Quite disappointing to say the least, given that Renegade previously had quite a wide variety of moves. While you would find it pretty difficult to find someone else to play this game with you, they can't anyway. Renegade 3 goes back to single player only, which is another shame considering that Target Renegade had two player co op. And all the graphics are now very much monochrome. Again, a bit of a downgrade, seeing as the other two Renegades were pretty colourful titles for the Specky. There are various reasons for these things happening, a lot of them coming out in 2019 when artist Ivan Horn finally agreed to come clean about Renegade 3 for a retro gamer article. The lack of moves and the general lack of speed, it is desperately slow, is attributed to the very wide variety of sprites that the game has, far more so than in the other two Renegades where a lot of the goons can share lower halves with each other. It's true, there's a pretty hefty amount of completely different sprites over the game's prehistoric, Egyptian, medieval and futuristic zones, and it's clear that a big chunk of work did get put in here. Sure, there's the rather silly enemy that's clearly a rip-off of Captain Caveman, but that is at least memorable. Unfortunately, in doing all this well, the animation most certainly suffered a great deal. As for the monochrome graphics, Ivan Horn simply puts this down to being the style that he and Deakin were accustomed to, 
Their previous games had largely been monochrome, and Renegade 3 ended up being the same way without all that much thought being given to it. Why? Well, because of the Specky's infamous colour clash. And sure, the easiest way to deal with the colour clash is to just use one colour and not have to think about it at all. But yeah, it's a shame considering what the other two games look like. Still, there's a lot more problems here. In the end, this is just a vastly broken game. As mentioned, it's just so slow. Even on 1 to 8k, it feels like it's constantly on the point of keeling over. The game can be cheesed quite easily. You don't have to do much through most of the stages, not even bothering to fight enemies and simply dealing with the various gaps. Not that this is always easy, because the collision detection is thoroughly balked. This is not a game where platforming is in any way a good idea. After that you get arena screens where you have to duke it out with a group of enemies before moving on. Basically what you do here is you go to the bottom right and you crouch punch enemies to death. They'll knock your health down to almost zero, but weirdly they won't actually kill you in this position, and you simply do this until all the enemies die. That in a nutshell is how you play the game and how you win. Well if it doesn't crash to basic before the end which is kind of likely. Ivanhorn was asked why they wouldn't have just used a base from Target Renegade, rather than building this sequel entirely from scratch in the short time they had. That's probably what would have been done today after all. But that wasn't usually done back then, according to Horn. With only one or two coders working on games, folks generally just did all of their own work, even if it's a sequel to a successful game that would greatly benefit from some adaptation if a different coder now has to work on it. And so that's part of the reason why this game ends up being such a total mess. There is one little saving grace. The music from Jonathan Dunn is, as is often the case with him, absolutely fantastic. But on its own that's hardly enough to save this game. It disappointed many, and made damn sure that even without the final chapter suffix signalling some sort of closure, there sure as hell weren't going to be a Renegade 4. Perhaps the final chapter was also applicable in another way. Renegade 3 is actually the final title to be released under the Imagine Software label, bringing a quite ignominious end to one of the Specky's more historic banners. The other ports of the game didn't fare any better, if anything it's even worse on the Amstrad CPC and the C64. While the problems with this game run so much deeper than the whole silly time travel concept, it perhaps would have helped if the game hadn't been tacked onto the Renegade series. It would have still been pretty damn rubbish regardless of that mind you. The time travel concept does perhaps necessitate having such a wide variety of enemies and completely different sprites, and a lot of other things like the speed and animation do suffer greatly for that. So yeah, there's a lot here that needed fixing, but the short development time put paid to any of that. In the end, um, can I put this game into a word? No. Into a sound? Ugh. And with that, Ocean's little expansion on Renegade came to a close. There was no attempt to take him into the 16-bit generation for any kind of new adventure or anything like that and his only appearance on any 16-bit platform is the rather dreadful Amiga and Atari ST ports of the original title that Software Creations knocked together. Mind you, there could well have been a 16-bit Renegade 3. It was in development, outsourced by Ocean to a company called Imagitech Design, but it never got finished and released. However, an early demo version has been leaked and available since the early 2000s. It's quite odd, Due to the rather shoddy nature of the graphics and all the bugs in this version, a lot of people did assume that this was some weird PD tribute of sorts to Renegade 3, made by some unknown person, and not official in the slightest. However, that is not the case. A combination of research on Amiga boards, a video highlighting the beta by the great Zeus Daz, and an Everything Amiga article by Dreamcatcher, have uncovered more of the truth. This was to be an official version, as confirmed by people like Coda, Adam Mastro Marino, and graphics artist Josie Lewis. What we see here is about halfway done, and there was a later version that so far is still lost in the ether. With the combo of Imagitech floundering as a company, people leaving, and Ocean presumably seeing the negative reception from fans that the third game got, it's perhaps not surprising that this game didn't end up getting finished. 
Could it have ended up being better than the 8-bit disaster pieces? Uh, let's face it, probably not. And so, Renegade is destined to forever remain an almost totally 8-bit icon. Perhaps that's for the best. Renegade deserves to be very well remembered as an 8-bit micro icon, even though that third game was a complete mess. The other two represent the best beat-em-up action you could find on the microcomputers at the time, particularly on the ZX Spectrum, and like the other truly great arcade ports of the day, it went to show that a little old Z80 and a handful of colours could still do a damn good job of giving people an awesome arcade experience. Bye for now!